What's up? Van occlusive disease is also called sinusoidal obstruction syndrome. It's a condition when, due to some reason, the obstruction within the liver sinusoids develops. First of all, to understand how van occlusive disease develops, we have to recall Splantnik circulation. You got to take care of our immortal souls. You know you can't read. It's the Bible, you get credit for trying. Initially, left ventricle push blood into the aorta, and from aorta blood is going into the splenic artery that supplies blood to the spleen, and mesenteric arteries that supply blood to the intestine, where in mesenteric capillaries fluid exchange occurs. To explain this, recall that cardiovascular system is a closed system, where fluid exchange occurs in capillaries because capillaries have pores. So we have afferent vessel that delivers blood to capillaries, we have afferent vessel that provides outflow of blood from capillaries, and we have capillaries that have pores. Through these pores in capillaries, fluid with nutrients can enter to the interstitial space. From the interstitium, cells that compose a particular tissue receive vital substances. But some portion of fluid after this usually remains in the interstitium. And then lymphatic system drains the excess fluid from the interstitial space into the venous system. The amount of fluid that cross capillaries and enters to the interstitium depends on filtration rate. And filtration rate is described by Starling equation. Filtration rate is equal to hydrostatic pressure difference between capillaries and interstitium minus oncotic pressure difference between capillary and interstitium and directly proportional to hydraulic conductivity. It's a simplified version of equation because in this case, to simplify, we suppose that values as oncotic reflection coefficient and surface area are constant. First of all, we see that hydrostatic pressure difference is the main driving force that push fluid out of the capillary. Oncotic pressure difference is the force that keeps fluid inside the capillary, and hydraulic conductivity, in fact, just describes how permeable is the membrane. And it's a general concept of fluid exchange that can be applied to every tissue. In case of intestine, mesenteric arteries delivers blood to mesenteric capillaries, mesenteric veins provide outflow of blood from capillaries, and cells that compose intestinal tissue called enterocytes. Then blood from the spleen by splenic vein and from the intestine by mesenteric veins is delivered to portal vein. Portal vein drains blood into the liver, where in liver capillaries that we call sinusoids, fluid exchange occurs. The principle is the same. The difference is that in case of liver tissue, the vessel that delivers blood to liver capillaries is portal vein, liver capillaries called sinusoids, the vessel that provides outflow of blood from capillaries is hepatic vein, and cells that compose liver tissue called hepatocytes. After fluid exchange in liver capillaries, blood is going to hepatic vein, and from hepatic vein, blood is drained to inferior vena cava. But also we have to know that in this system we have additional vessels that remain from embryogenesis. Such vessels we call portosystemic collateral blood vessels. What the fuck is this? Back in times of embryogenesis, these vessels were crucial. They provided flow to esophageal and gastric veins. Also, they provided flow to paraumbilical and superficial epigastric veins that are located on anterior abdominal wall. And also, they provided flow to upper anal canal veins. And from all these veins, blood is drained into the inferior vena cava. Adult person in normal condition practically do not use portosystemic collateral vessels, because adult person has portal vein pump line that provides flow of huge amount of blood. From inferior vena cava, blood goes into the right atrium and right ventricle of the heart, then blood crosses pulmonary circulation and goes into the left atrium, left ventricle, and from left ventricle, again, heart pushes blood into the aorta. So this cycle can be repeated over and over again. <laughs> what are you looking at? Back to work. The most common reason why when occlusive disease develops is the side effect of high dose chemotherapy. The reason is that before liver transplantation or during the treatment of acute leucosis, for example, 
we should give to a patient a high-dose chemotherapy to decrease the amount of immune cells or malignant cells. And usually, chemotherapeutic drugs have a potent hepatotoxic effect. So when chemotherapy causes liver injury, liver reacts to injury by fibrosis to repair the damage. But the problem with fibrosis is that at some point severe fibrosis will compress intrahepatic vessels as liver sinusoids. And it's a moment when venoocclusive disease begins to progress. So with progression of fibrosis, fibrous tissue begins to compress liver sinusoids. And this time this will cause an obstruction to flow at the distal region of the liver sinusoids that will dramatically affect the hemodynamics of the entire splanchnic circulation. With all due respect, what the fuck are you talking about? So let's explain this. The blood flow from liver sinusoids to hepatic vein is equal to pressure inside the liver sinusoids minus pressure inside the inferior vena cava divided on resistance between them. And the resistance is inversely proportional to the force power of radius. So if obstruction in the distal region of the liver sinusoids occurs, then radius inside the liver sinusoids decrease. With decrease in radius, resistance increase and flow through this area decrease. So the inflow of blood to liver sinusoids remains the same. The outflow of blood decreases due to a thrombosis. This results in accumulation of fluid proximal to the thrombosis. Initially, blood begins to accumulate in the liver sinusoids. First of all, it will affect liver tissue and cause so-called nutmeg liver and hepatomegaly. In addition to this, increase in volume of fluid inside the liver sinusoids cause increase in hydrostatic pressure. And increase in hydrostatic pressure cause edema of the liver tissue that manifests with ascites and abdominal pain. To explain how all these symptoms develop, let's take a closer look at fluid exchange inside the liver tissue. Gentlemen. So we have fluid inflow to the liver sinusoids that is provided by the portal vein, and fluid outflow from the liver tissue that is provided by hepatic vein. In normal conditions they are in balance. But if liver sinusoids become obstructed, it will cause an obstruction to flow from liver sinusoids to hepatic vein. Because recall that flow equals to pressure difference divided on resistance, and resistance is inversely proportional to the radius. So if obstruction is present, it will cause a decrease in radius of the sinusoid. With decrease in radius, resistance increase. And with increase in resistance, flow through this region will decrease. So with obstruction of the liver sinusoids, the outflow of blood decreases, but the amount of blood that is delivered to liver sinusoids by the portal vein remains the same. The blood inflow to capillaries becomes higher than blood outflow. As a result, blood begins to accumulate inside the liver sinusoids. The volume of blood in capillaries will increase, and with increase in volume, hydrostatic pressure increases and increase in hydrostatic pressure cause increase in filtration rate from liver sinusoids to interstitial space of the liver tissue. Because recall that hydrostatic pressure is basically a weight of fluid that acts on a particular area, and weight of fluid equals to mass of fluid times gravity constant, in turn mass of fluid equals to fluid density times fluid volume. So as we see volume and hydrostatic pressure are directly related, so, in venoocclusive disease, thrombosis of liver sinusoids or compression of liver sinusoids by fibrosis cause an obstruction to flow. This results in the increase in volume of fluid inside the liver sinusoids, and increase in volume of fluid cause increase in hydrostatic pressure that results in increase in filtration rate. So, the higher the capillary hydrostatic pressure, the higher becomes filtration rate. So the more fluid volume will cross from liver sinusoids to interstitial space. And at some point fluid income to the interstitial space will be higher than lymphatic drainage. So fluid will progressively accumulate in the interstitium. And accumulation of fluid in the interstitial space will cause edema. From the interstitium fluid leaves liver tissue and is going into the space between liver tissue and liver capsule. Accumulation of fluid in subcapsular space causes distension of the liver capsule, and because liver capsule has a lot of nerve endings, 
distension of the liver capsule cause abdominal pain in right upper quadrant. Also, some portion of fluid leaks through the capsule into the abdominal cavity and accumulation of fluid in the abdominal cavity called ascites. Another problem is that, as we see, a lot of blood gets stuck and accumulates in the liver tissue. But it's venous blood and thereby it's blood with low amount of oxygen. So to explain this, in normal condition in liver sinusoids, oxygenated blood prevails over deoxygenated blood because any tissue requires oxygen for aerobic metabolism, like electron transport chain, for example. With thrombosis or compression that cause backup of venous blood, the amount of deoxygenated blood increase, and the amount of blood with oxygen decrease. So at some point, accumulation of blood without oxygen will provoke ischemia of hepatocytes, and with ischemia, aerobic metabolism decrease, and as a result, hepatocytes undergo fat dystrophy that results in formation of lipid droplets inside them. Congested and dilated hepatic veins give this red-brown color to liver tissue. Lipid droplets give this a little bit of pale yellow color. And together, this combination of red-brown and yellow color resembles an atmeg. So because of this, we call such liver tissue an atmeg liver. Simple, easy to remember. This time, the backup of blood due to an obstruction in liver sinusoids cause accumulation of blood inside the portal vein. With accumulation of fluid, hydrostatic pressure inside the portal vein increase, and increase in portal venous pressure we call portal hypertension. So portal hypertension develops. And the combination of portal hypertension and the obstruction in liver sinusoids force a larger volume of blood to go into the portosystemic collateral vessels. These vessels also called portosystemic shunts. The problem is that the more severe becomes portal hypertension, the higher volume of blood is going into the portosystemic collateral vessels. And the higher the volume of fluid inside these vessels, the more distended they become. So to explain this, there is a vessel with fluid inside it. Fluid flow occurs from left to right and fluid has some hydrostatic pressure. And as we know, hydrostatic pressure acts in all directions. Recall that hydrostatic pressure is basically a weight of fluid that acts on a particular area. And weight of fluid equals to mass of fluid times gravity constant. In turn, mass of fluid equals to fluid density times fluid volume. So basically, volume and hydrostatic pressure are directly related. Also, we have to know that because hydrostatic pressure acts in all directions, it determines the wall tension. I recall that wall tension is determined by the Laplace law. Laplace law states that the wall tension is equal to pressure difference between the pressure that acts from the inside of the vessel minus pressure that acts from the outside of the blood vessel. Also, wall tension is directly proportional to the radius of the vessel and inversely proportional to the thickness of the vessel. So the higher the volume of fluid inside the vessel, the higher becomes hydrostatic pressure. And with increasing hydrostatic pressure, wall tension increase. You see, there is only one constant. One universal, it is the only real cause. Causality. Action, reaction. Cause and effect. So in this case, the inflow of blood to portosystemic collateral vessels increase. With increase in fluid inflow, more volume of fluid will be located inside the vessel. With increase in volume, hydrostatic pressure increase. With increase in hydrostatic pressure, wall tension increase. Increase in wall tension causes vessel wall distension. Because collateral vessels are veins, and veins have very high compliance, they can be very easily distended. Basically, they are like balloons. And such over-distended veins we call varices. Distension of esophageal veins and gastric veins cause formation of esophageal varices and gastric varices. Distension of paraumbilical and superficial epigastric veins cause formation of caput medusa on anterior abdominal wall. And distension of upper anal canal veins cause formation of hemorrhoids. The problem with varices is that the more distended they become, the higher is the chance of their rupture. So with time, due to an obstruction, the higher volume of blood becomes stuck initially in liver sinusoids 
and then the backup of blood cause accumulation of blood inside the portal vein. The more blood accumulate, the more severe becomes portal hypertension. The more severe becomes portal hypertension, the more volume of fluid goes into the portosystemic collateral vessels. I don't feel good about this. I don't feel good about what this! What do you feel good about anything? So with time, the inflow of blood to portosystemic shunts increase. So the volume of fluid inside the shunts increase. With increase in volume of fluid, hydrostatic pressure inside the shunts increase. With increase of hydrostatic pressure, wall tension increase. Increase in wall tension causes more severe vessel wall distension. And with time, if portal hypertension becomes even more severe, even more fluid will pass through the collateral vessels. Increase in fluid inflow causes increase in fluid volume inside them. Increase in volume of fluid causes increase in hydrostatic pressure. Increase in hydrostatic pressure causes increase in vessel wall tension. And when wall tension reach a critical level, the force that is applied by hydrostatic pressure to blood vessel wall will prevail over the ability of the vessel wall to distend. And when this happens, critical wall tension causes rupture of the blood vessel. So the more severe becomes portal hypertension, the higher the chance that rupture of esophageal varices will happen, and this will cause upper GI bleeding. Also, the caput medusa on anterior abdominal wall will become more prominent, and also the higher the chance that rupture of hemorrhoids will occur, and this can cause lower GI bleeding. Also, flow that bypass liver is non-physiologic. Recall that in our blood we have some dangerous substances, as free ammonia and unconjugated bilirubin, and the organ that provides their detoxification is liver. In normal condition, portal vein pump line delivers blood to the liver, where liver makes from dangerous ammonia molecules a urea molecule, which is less harmful substance. And also liver provides conjugation of bilirubin, and only after blood is going to inferior vena cava. But blood that inflow to shunts bypass liver, thereby blood do not undergo any detoxification. As a result, first of all, it can cause increase in blood ammonia level, that can cause hepatic encephalopathy, and also it can cause increase in free bilirubin level, that manifest as jaundice. So increase in blood flow through the portosystemic shunts cause increase in blood ammonia level, that can cause hepatic encephalopathy and also it can cause increase in free bilirubin level, as it can cause jaundice. Good. Great. After portal vein, blood begins to accumulate in the splenic vein, and after in the spleen. Increase in blood volume inside the spleen causes spleen distension, and enlargement of the spleen we call splenomegaly. Also blood begins to accumulate in mesenteric veins, and after in mesenteric capillaries. With increase in volume of blood, hydrostatic pressure inside the mesenteric capillaries increase. Increase in hydrostatic pressure inside the mesenteric capillaries cause edema of the mesenteric tissue that results in ascites. So let's explain why ascites develops. So we have blood inflow to mesenteric capillaries and blood outflow from mesenteric capillaries initially into the portal vein then into the liver sinusoids and after into the hepatic vein and inferior vena cava. So if obstruction of the liver sinusoids develops, this causes a backup of blood, because recall that flow equals to pressure difference divided on resistance, and resistance is inversely proportional to the force power of radius. So with obstruction, radius of the liver sinusoids will decrease, with decrease in radius, resistance increase and with increase in resistance, flow through this region will decrease. And because our cardiovascular system is a closed system, fluid cannot just disappear. So fluid begins to accumulate initially at the liver sinusoids, then in the portal vein, and finally in mesenteric capillaries. So we can say that fluid outflow decreases, but fluid inflow to mesenteric capillaries remains the same. As a result, fluid begin to progressively accumulate inside the mesenteric capillaries. With increase in fluid volume, hydrostatic pressure increase. Increase in hydrostatic pressure cause increase in filtration rate. Because recall that volume and hydrostatic pressure are directly related. So in when occlusive disease, 
thrombosis of liver sinusoids or compression of liver sinusoids by fibrosis cause an obstruction to flow. This results in increase in volume of fluid inside the liver sinusoids and increase in volume of fluid cause increase in hydrostatic pressure that results in increase in filtration rate. So the higher the capillary hydrostatic pressure, the higher becomes filtration rate. So the more fluid will income to the interstitial space. And at some point fluid income to the interstitial space will be higher than lymphatic drainage. So fluid will progressively accumulate in the interstitium. And the accumulation of fluid in the interstitial space will cause edema. From the interstitium, fluid leaves intestinal tissue and is going into the abdominal cavity and the accumulation of fluid in the abdominal cavity called ascites. What do we learn, Palmer? I don't know, sir. I don't fucking know either. So, as we see, one occlusive disease has a numerous symptoms. It's liver pathology that is characterized by ascites of hepatic origin, abdominal pain, not liver, and hepatomegaly. Also, portal hypertension develops that cause formation of varices. It's esophageal and gastric varices, caput medusa, and hemorrhoids. Also, shunts cause increase in blood ammonia level that can cause hepatic encephalopathy, and increase in free bilirubin level that can cause jaundice. And finally, it can be complicated by rupture of varices that can cause upper and lower GI bleeding. Also, the size of the spleen increase. And in addition to this, ascites of mesenteric origin develops. Such fluid retention from liver and mesenteric ascites cause increase in body weight, so weight gain is also a common symptom. Okay. Fine. Yep. Ciao! What's that mean? Ciao. It's Italian. It means food. 